heard things about how our wheat has been genetically messed with, confused about the difference between hybridization and genetically modified. Just curious what in the world is going on with our wheat today, if anything. Stay tuned because in this video, we are gonna be diving back in to a big wheat myth and busting that one up today. <music> Hey everyone, welcome back to Grains and Grit. My name is Felicia, and if you're new here, welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Today is a video that I've been working on for a while now to compile a kind of a complicated subject down where hopefully it is easy for y'all to understand without all the crazy sciencey talking and stuff like that. Today, we're ultimately gonna be talking about the difference between hybridization and genetically modified when it comes to our food. And the reason we're getting into this is because there's been a lot of deception going on, especially with books like this one, about our wheat. Terms about how wheat has been genetically manipulated, um, things like that. It has resulted into a, a lot of confusion when it comes to our wheat. In fact, I frequently get the comments about how our wheat is genetically modified, and I'll go ahead and tell you that ain't true. <laughs> but we are gonna be diving in to what has been said about wheat. Is it been genetically messed with the difference between hybridization, genetically modified? We're also gonna be tying this into the Bible, believe it or not. And you're probably asking yourself, why Felicia? What does the Bible say about genetically modified food? Well, it doesn't have that phrase in there. But as Christians, the Bible should be our foundation for everything. Everything that this world throws at us, we always need to be comparing it back to God's word. And he does say things about our food, about wheat, um, things like that, that we can glean from the scripture, even though they don't talk about genetically modification or hybridization specifically. I'm also gonna be talking about what has happened with the wheat we have today, because I know a lot of people have been told because of books like this one again, that our wheat is nothing like it used to be and therefore it's now poison and horrible, don't consume it, blah, blah, blah. And we're gonna be diving into what happened. Is it been genetically messed with? Is it been hybridized? Should we be consuming it? What the confusion is when it comes to our wheat. So get your thinking caps on y'all, buckle up because we diving in today. So first of all, we're just gonna be diving into the basic definitions of what hybridization is as when it comes to food um, or things in general, what the difference between hybridization and genetically modified. And for those of you who may already know this, I do have timestamps down below. Be sure to check out the description box down there if you wanna skip around to things that you may not know about and skip this part or whatever. Also the, down in the description box, I will have all my references um, to the things I'll be talking about today. So again, description box down below to check all of that out. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my newsletter if you haven't already. I do have some freebies for you guys, a free grain calculator and a little ingredient cheat sheet that I have as well. So if you haven't grabbed those, get those down below. Oh, and if you don't know, follow me on Instagram as well. If you would like to follow my more day-to-day -day life and the behind the scenes stuff, you can check me out on Instagram at grains and grit. All right, so first of all, let's just get some basics down. What is the definition of hybridization and what is the definition of genetically modified? So let's just look at just some common dictionaries that we have lying around. So according to botanylibrary.com, um, hybridization definition, their definition is the mating or crossing up two plants or lines of dissimilar, which is not of the same kind, they're different. Um, plant lines of dissimilar genotype is known as hybridization. Um, in plants, crossing is done by placing pollen grains from one genotype, a male parent, on the stigma of flowers of another genotype, a female parent. And if you didn't know that plants do have a male and female counterpart, you learned something new today as well. But even plants have a male and a female. <laughs> So in other words, this is just a male plant, a female plant, they cross together, um, they are not related to each other, and then they have offspring, they have baby seedlings. Another definition according to just plain old dictionary.com, hybridization is producing offspring from parents of different stock. That's it. So to put this actually in human terms, um, I'm not related to my husband, except by marriage, thank God. <laughs> um, so we are not brother and sister. We are not identical. Um, we are com 
we do come from different stock. We bring our different genes in together and then we have had children from that. But I did not marry a tomato. So we are the same because we are both humans and we cross together and we can have offspring. Um, we are not a human and a tomato trying to cross together. Um, we are of the same kind, but yet we have different stock. We come from different gene pools. Okay, so that's the basic definition of hybridization. Pretty simple. So we've defined what hybridization is. Now let's go to the actual definitions that people use for genetically modified and see if you can spot the differences. So according to this plain old Wikipedia, genetically modified organism, and for the sake of time, that is GMO. If you hear me say GMO, we're talking about a genetically modified organism. So a GMO is an organism whose genetic material has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. The exact definition of GMOs and what constitutes genetic engineering varies, with the most common being an organism altered in a way that, quote, does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. Okay, so hang on to that one. That's Wikipedia's. Another one by Britannica, their definition, a GMO is an organism whose DNA has been modified in the laboratory in order to favor the expression of desired physiological traits or the production of desired biological products. So that one's a bit more vague. It's just saying that it's been modified in a lab the DNA has been modified in a lab. Okay, and then now we're gonna go on to National Geographic article and they have a long thing about GMO. So they state that a GMO is an animal, plant, or microbe whose DNA has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. Again, kind of broad. Now they do actually go on to state that for thousands of years, humans have been using breeding methods to modify organisms. So things like corn, cattle, even dogs, um, we have used selective breeding. So that's another phrase that you might hear, that's hybridization. You hear selective breeding, that's hybridization. And we've been doing this for thousands of years, is what they state. However, modern advances in biotechnology have allowed scientists to directly modify the DNA of microorganisms, crops, and animals. They go on to say GMO food do cause controversy. Yeah, if you've been living under a rock, then yes, G GMO food does cause controversy. However, um, they state genetic engineering typically changes an organism in a way that would not occur naturally. It is even common for scientists to insert genes into an organism from an entirely different species. So those are the definitions from different sources for GMO. To sum up in a very basic way, hybridization occurs naturally. It occurs in nature. You're not crossing species to breed. So humans mate with humans, um, flowers mate with flowers, dogs mate with dogs, cats mate with cats. That happens naturally in nature, has been since God created the earth. That is hybridization or selective breeding. That's what we're talking about. GMO, genetically modified, are using genetic engineering techniques. They take it into the laboratory, they splice the DNA of one species, and quite often, most of the time, they are inserting DNA from a completely different species into that organism. This does not happen in nature. Um, tomatoes do not naturally breed with dogs, for example. I mean, you know this. The Bible talks about different kinds. And if you just, you know, use your brain and look around, you're able to identify what can breed with what naturally. And there actually are some surprises that people don't think about. For example, lions and tigers are the same kind. They're big cats and they can breed together, even though you wouldn't think they would, but um, they have done that and you get a liger, a combination of a lion and a tiger. So even though we might identify, they are definitely different species by our definition, they fall under the same kind that the Bible talks about. Um, so again, they're just, they're the cat kind. They can still breed within each other. Okay, so we have the definition. So we've distinguished between the difference between hybridization and genetically modified. Do not, 
intertwined these. And this has been a huge confusion with wheat is because especially in books like Wheat Belly, he throws out genetically altered um, things like that that make you think they, that wheat is a genetically modified crop because GMOs is kind of now a term that many of us are very familiar with. So when we hear about things being genetically altered, we instantly think GMOs. And so that's why I believe a lot of people think that wheat is a genetically modified crop nowadays. And it's just not, this is a, this is a lie. If anyone tells you it's a lie. And the way that we know this is first of all, just Google it. The FDA has never once approved of GMO wheat. So that's the big one there. Now there have been trials for GMO wheat. For example, um, one in England that they reported on in 2012, um, there were trials going on in the UK um, for a genetically modified wheat. And here's how you know it's genetically modified if you just read it, is because they actually state that they um, spliced the genes of the wheat and inserted genes from peppermint plants because the point of this is they're wanting to repel aphids and peppermint anyone who's in organic gardening knows that peppermint can sometimes repel um certain bugs and funny thing they actually called this whiffy wheat <laughs> which i can't say without laughing whiffy wheat <laughs> whatever nice name anyway it was a huge failure it actually, I think, attracted more aphids, um, but that was genetically modified. They had a wheat, they inserted genes from a peppermint plant. So not the same at all. They would not naturally breed together in the slightest, um, but they inserted that into the wheat and they grew it. Um, it completely failed. So they're not doing that anymore, but that was a trial in 2012 that came out. So you might've heard of trials going on, but no one is actually selling GMO wheat because it's not been approved by anyone. They so far have failed at it. No one wants it. So just rest at ease, there is no GMO wheat. And if you're still freaked out about this, if you still don't believe me, then buy organic wheat berries because by definition, organic cannot be genetically modified. All right, so now let's look at the history of hybridization and genetically modification. I've kind of mentioned this before already, but as we can see, um, hybridization has occurred for thousands of years. And this is where we can easily go back to God's word to see what he has to say about it. Because yes, yes, God's word has something to say about this as well um, in a roundabout way. First of all, Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Also in Genesis, we know that God created this world. We have an amazing creator. We have an intelligent designer, and that is God Almighty, the God of the Bible, that the earth was created in six literal days, and God rested on the seventh, hence why we have our seven-day week. And God created everything. And also, this is going to be um, throwing off the whole hunter-gatherer thing that we were first hunter-gatherers. Where did God place us first? He created Adam and Eve and placed them in a garden. And in Genesis 2, he commands them to dress it, to tend to it. He wants us to dress and keep the garden. So when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in a garden, grew everything for them and said, hey, keep up with it, take care of it. Now, now they weren't, sin had not entered into the world yet, so it was quite easy to do, but still, even before the fall, God put him in a garden, said dress and keep it. Um, and then he gave us the food of the plants to eat in the garden. So when he first created us, we were put in a garden. Then the fall came, Adam and Eve sinned, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. The world is no longer perfect. We now have thorns growing up. That's part of the curse is that by the sweat of our brow, we're gonna have to toil for our food. And we immediately see in their offspring in with Cain, the Bible says that he was a tiller of the ground. So guess what y'all, from the beginning, we had been farmers from the beginning. We've had agriculture. We were not originally hunter gatherers and then eventually went into agriculture. Now there are certain groups that are hunter gatherers. We do see that, that's very logical, but we've actually been farming from the beginning. But that's a whole other video. Back to the hybridization and GMO. So we have been farmers from the beginning and hybridization is a very natural process. If you think about it, what happens whenever plants um, animals, humans, when they don't adapt to their environment, you die. 
So God, again, going back to Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and he made his creation to be able to adapt, to hybridize. And that is how we're adapting to make sure that we get different gene pools that come in. So if two plants, um, say if two plants are breeding together and one of them and both of them are not able to resist a certain parasite or virus um, of the plant, well, guess what's going to happen to those plants? They're going to die. But what happens is one plant, they pollinate with others. It's kind of the, the survival of the fittest, in essence. I mean, the stronger genes are going to survive. If you keep breeding sick plants to sick plants, you're going to have sick offspring and eventually they're going to die. Same thing with humans, same thing with dogs. It's why, especially with dogs, we selectively breed for certain traits and that's all that hybridization is. And we can see that going on all the way back into the story of Jacob in the Bible. So let's look at that. So let's open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 30 with the story of Jacob. Um, he is now wanting to leave his father-in-law with his two wives, his family, blah, 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 blah. He's been cheated out of wages, read the story. And God blessed Jacob while he was at, um, while he was working for Laban, his father-in-law. Again, not gonna go into the whole backstory. And he is now wanting to leave and Laban asks what his wages will be because Jacob Jacob is asking for his wages. So Jacob says, thou shalt not give me anything. Skip down. This is chapter 30, verse 31. We're starting in and then 32. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats and of such will be my hire. So Jacob said, hey, you know what? My my portion, my wages, will um, I will take all the spotted and speckled ones, which generally was seen as, um, you get the impression, those are kind of seen as the weaker cattle um, livestock, and Laban would get the pretty looking ones. So Jacob said, let me pull out all the ring straight, the spotted ones, the ugly ones, and I will set aside the pretty ones for you, Laban. And then it gets interesting of what Jacob did. So then skip down to verse 37. It says, And Jacob took rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and piled white streaks in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters and the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring streaked, speckled, and spotted. Spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not into Laban's cattle. And it came to pass whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Okay, so to summarize what happened, and I do not know if this was some miracle of God or some science that I don't know about, <laughs> but bottom line is Jacob knew, he knew that if you breed together too strong livestock, you're going to get a strong offspring. We know this today. If you breed too weak ones, you're going to get a weak offspring. It's why people, um, we've raised goats before, anyone who's done livestock, you want your strong cattle, you want your strong livestock to breed so you have a more likelihood of having a strong offspring um, instead of a sick one that's going to just die on you and you lose out on that livestock and you lose your money. So he knew that however this worked with the poplar trees and everything, um, Jacob knew, okay, when the strong cattle come now they weren't necessarily ring straked when they came but they came and then he put the rods before the strong livestock and then when they conceived their offspring was ring straked so just looking at it that was the deal that he had with laban is to get all the spotted and ring straked cattle or livestock but in doing that because of this miracle or science or whatever it was he, he only did this with the stronger, so the offspring, even though they didn't look perfect, they were the stronger breed. So he knew about hybridization. That's what this is. He's breeding strong cattle to strong cattle or strong livestock to strong livestock to get strong offspring. So they knew about this all the way back in the story of Jacob. So again, we're not, we just nothing about saying hybridization in the Bible, but obviously they knew about 
hybridization. If you breed strong ones together, two parents, two strong parents, you're gonna have a strong offspring. So it's selective breeding, that's hybridization. That's what that is and it's been going on for thousands of years among plants, animals, even humans. We do it too, y'all. Now we're gonna talk about the whole what's going on with the modern wheat thing. Okay, because there's a lot of confusion with this. Wheat has been around for forever. <laughs> I mean, God did create it. We have been farming it. I mean, we can go all the way back, all the way back to Mesopotamia. Um, thousands and thousands of years ago, we have found wheat in wheat berries in ancient Egyptian tombs. I mean, we've obviously had wheat for a long period of time. We know about many of these ancient grains, such as emmer and einkorn, were some of the originals and then came into rye and spelt. And all of these are basically hybridizations. It came from wild. It was first wild. And then man started calling cultivating it we started farming it and we started realizing hey if, okay these two together worked these survived so let's take the survivors and let's breed these together plant them next to each other because plants are going to pollinate with each other if they're close in proximity um so we've been doing this for thousands of years and so then we get to modern times and then what happened is in the 1950s norman borlaug um, went to Mexico. And the purpose of this, long story short, is he um, and other scientists were trying to figure out how to grow um, wheat in particular in poor conditions. So places like Mexico, um, in Asia, especially for these third, oh sorry, in India, especially for these third world countries that people were starving. And they wanted to find out, okay, what, what, a, what can grow? How can we make these plants grow better in poor condition and they went with wheat and it went a long time <laughs> so he started in 1953 and all that this was was hybridization he was taking different strands of wheat and he was just selectively breeding them together um and figuring out you know what traits they had a biggest is a huge issue that they were combating was a certain type of virus and they were trying to get plants that were naturally stronger against this virus they wanted plants that were going to be um, that were going to produce in poor soils they were going to produce a lot to feed a lot of people that was their mission and over 16 years it took 16 years to eventually get what we call our modern dwarf wheat which is a shorter wheat than the tall waving grains we hear in the song and it can grow in poor conditions. So that's what he did back in the 50s. Um, he was praised a lot, received a lot of awards for this, the Nobel Peace Prize, I believe, is what he received, because now countries like Mexico, India, that had a lot of people to feed and didn't have the best growing conditions in certain places, they were now able to grow wheat, a grain, which can definitely feed a lot of bellies and do it really well and healthily. Um, and that's what he did by just crossbreeding a whole different bunch of wheat plants. By that point, we had a lot of hybridized wheat plants and they just took hybridization among hybridization and, and did it. And he did what was a, um, called a back cross where they take two parents, they have an offspring, you take that offspring and you cross it again with a parent, you have another offspring and then you take that offspring and you know you keep kind of going back until you get the desired results. This is not genetic modification, it is hybridization. He did not take a wheat plant and then insert DNA from a completely different species to come up with whatever GMO wheat. It was hybridization. Now they were focused on it, they were studying it, so it definitely happened faster than it would have in the wild because they are focused, but that's the beauty of science, y'all. That's, I mean, science is knowledge, it's studying, it's, it's observing, that's science. And God gave us a brain to do that because guess what, y'all, for thousands of years, there was no Walmart, there was no Amazon, and in many places in this world, they still don't exist. There's no McDonald's on the corner or whatever to get food. You either grow it, you hunt it, or you die. And I guarantee you, when people's soul food was coming from whatever they could grow, you're gonna be paying attention and seeing what you can do for to get it done well, to feed a lot of people, to grow. I mean, again, God gave us brains and the skills to observe and to see this, to figure it out. And that's just what they did. It was just science, they were observing, they crossbred, it's hybridization. That's our modern wheat that we have today, not been genetically modified. To further prove this, genetically modification was not even invented until 1973. 
Norman Borlaug did his wheat experience to get our modern dwarf wheat that is predominantly used in the 50s. And genetic modification was invented, it came about in 1973. And the US Supreme Court um, only allowed GMOs to be patented in 1980. And then the first FDA approved GMO crop did not come about until 1992, and that was tomatoes. So long after <laughs> Norman Borlaug hybridized the wheat that is predominantly used today. So again, wheat, not been genetically modified, not been approved by the FDA to be genetically modified. It has been hybridized, something that can happen naturally. Just humans got involved, like the Bible says for us to do. God did command us in Genesis 1. He created Adam, and then he said in Genesis 1, 28, to go and subdue the earth, to have dominion over it. We are to have dominion over creation. No, we're not supposed to be wasteful. We're supposed to take care of what God has given us, but we are also, but it's perfectly fine to figure out that, hey, if I take this wheat plant and cross it with this wheat plant, I get a better offspring that's gonna feed my family better and it's gonna feed others as well. So that's it, y'all. That's what hybridization is. And that's what's happened with, that's what's happened with our modern wheat. Now, how we have been dece deceived by books like this, and to combat some of the, the points that he makes in those books. So, one thing that he states is in the book is this, quote, This thing being sold to us called wheat, it ain't wheat. It's this stocky little high-yield plant, a distant relative of the wheat our mothers used to bake muffins, genetically and biochemically light years removed from the wheat of just 40 years ago. But you see what he states in there is that he states it's genetically and biochemically light years removed from the wheat of just 40 years ago. That is deceptive, y'all, because he's throwing out those terms like genetically different and we automatically think genetically modified and it's not. It's been hybridized, something that's been going on for thousands of years. Another point in his book that is very deceiving is on page 25. He's talking about bad breeding of wheat. And here's what he says, and I'm gonna explain this for you, so just hold on. He says, analysis of proteins expressed by a wheat hybrid compared to its two parent strains have demonstrated that while approximately 95% of the proteins expressed in the offspring are the same, 5% are unique found in neither parent. But he, before this, he's making a point that we have not studied how wheat being hybridized is, can mess with our system, so on and so forth. And then he goes on to state that, well, 5% when hybridized, um, the protein expressed is found in neither parent. And that sounds like a horrible thing. It sounds like this new offspring of wheat is this horrible, genetically mutated um, plant because 5% of it doesn't even appear in the parents. All right, so genetics 101, let me explain this to you. He does state analysis of proteins expressed by a wheat hybrid. So in genetics, whenever you hear the word expressed, another way to say that is show. <laughs> what has been shown in the offspring? What genetic traits do you see, observe in the offspring? So. He state he gives you the impression that 5% of the offspring of these wheat plants are completely different. It's not even in the parent plants. And how horrible is this thing? First of all, that is impossible. It is impossible for two things to be bred together and have some sort of offspring. And that offspring have something in its genes that is not found in the genetic code of either parent. And I know this is getting technical, but hold on with me. I'll just hang, just hang on. Let me give you an example of what this means. I <laughs> um, have lighter hair. Uh, whenever I was a child, I actually had platinum blonde hair, um, but right now it's brown. So I have brown hair. I have brown hair. I have blue eyes. My husband has very dark hair, and he actually has green eyes. So let's focus on the eyes. I'm blue eyes, and my husband has green eyes. So what do you think we have for our children? Well, surprise, we actually have a son that has hazel eyes. I do not have hazel eyes. My husband does not have hazel eyes. How in the world did we get a child who has completely different eyes than, than is shown 
than is it expressed in either parent. So you follow me so far? That does not mean that those hazel eyes have just appeared magically out of nowhere and my son is now some freak of nature that's been genetically altered. Those hazel eyes are in the gene code of either me or my husband. And it actually is both of us because I have a grandfather with hazel eyes and so does my husband. My husband has a grandfather with hazel eyes. So it's in our genetic code for hazel eyes. And you know what? We happen to have a son that has those hazel eyes. I didn't get it. My husband didn't get it. It skipped a couple generations because our parents don't even have hazel eyes. It's our grandfathers that have it. And so it was suppressed, but it's still in our genetic code. And then it was expressed in our son. It was not expressed in me or my husband, but it has been expressed in our son. So that's what it means whenever you hear the word expressed in genetics. It's just what can you see? What genetic traits do you see? This is also why sometimes you have two light eyed people have a brown eyed child or why two parents who have say brown hair or blonde hair, they might have a red headed child, even though neither one of them have red hair, but it's in our genetic code. A child of ours is not going to have something that is in neither one of our genetic code. It's in there somewhere. We not, might not show it, but it can show up in your children. So again, that's how books like this can be deceiving and why a lot of people are freaking out about wheat. So hopefully you've been hanging on for that, um, getting into that whole science part of it. Now, another thing about hybridization. There are so many other crops that have been hybridized and you probably haven't even thought about it unless you've actually gardened yourself, which many of y'all probably have. So for example, bananas. This is what the original banana looked like. Doesn't look like a banana that we eat today, does it? <laughs> but that's what a banana used to look like. But because we have taken, humans have taken bananas and we have crossed it, um, you know, with other bananas, things like that. That's how we have the banana that we have today. So your modern banana, your yellow banana, um, that is a hybridization. Oranges have been greatly hybridized. And we know this from personal experience, um, going to a local, to Marjorie Kenan Rawlings um, estate. She's a famous Florida author of The Yearling. And she had huge orange groves when she lived here in Florida. And um, it's now, most of it has gone completely wild because they're just maintaining the actual um, estate her house sits on. And we actually went out into her old orange groves that are completely grown up now grab some wild oranges and well, let me tell you, those babies are sour because surprise, <laughs> wild oranges are actually sour. The oranges we know today that are sweet, those are hybridizations. They do it by grafting. Um, if you have any sort of fruit trees, um, you're probably familiar, that's generally how you hybridize with fruit trees is you graft in um, an old plant to a new. That's another biblical term we do see in the Bible is about grafting, but that's another story. Um, Valencia oranges, which is my favorite oranges, are super sweet and delicious. Those are hybridizations um, of actually the pomelo orange, I'm not familiar with that one, and the mandarin orange. They were grafted together, we came up with Valencia, and that's how we have our sweet oranges today, is because humans figured out how to hybridize them to get them sweet and not sour. Apples, another huge hybridization. If you've heard of Honeycrisp apples, which are wildly popular, those were come about in 1994 along with Honeygold. The University of Missouri is very much responsible for a lot of the hybridization of apples today. So a lot of our apples are hybridized, y'all, and it, they're apples. They're just cro apples crossed with apples to get a different type of apple that tastes different. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just hybridized. Of course, another thing is dogs. Dogs have been hybridized to, I mean, wow. I mean, think about it. If a chihuahua was released into the wild, it would not survive. <laughs> so it has been hybridized to where I think they're kind of rats, but you know, they're, they're technically dogs, but chihuahuas are very much hybridized. Pugs, I mean, think of all the dogs that we have. They're all hybridized. And of course, I've mentioned that humans, we are very much hybridized as well. And that's how we keep our gene pool fresh and alive and how we stay alive. And so we hybridize together so we can keep going on passing our genes, the stronger genes on to survive. So how is it that so many people have gotten this wrong about wheat thinking that has been genetically altered to a point where we, it's just not even wheat anymore, which is just not true. 
Well, now here is where people really get it. They just get it wrong. Like they're there and then they, they get it wrong. And that's because y'all, it's not the wheat. It's the flour that has been messed with. And I've been preaching this since I started this channel. Okay. This is why I have this channel y'all, because there is a huge difference between a wheat between flour that you've milled at home from a whole wheat berry and you have whole grain compared to the fake flour that has been stripped of its nutrients, stripped of all of its goodness in the store. And a lot of the bread in the store that's made with fake flour, even more gluten added to it, and it's just fake. And so there is a huge difference between whole grain flour, true whole grain, and white flour. Y'all, it is the flour that's been messed with. And you can see this in articles like on Mark's Daily Apple. Um, I'll link that below where they're just going forth and they talk about wheat. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like wheat, nutritious. And then they talk about how, then they start saying that it's really bad and unhealthy for you. And the whole time I'm thinking it's not the wheat grain itself. It's the flour. You're talking about the flour, how it's deficient in nutrients and white flour is. So it's the flour that's been messed with y'all. It's not the wheat. There's no GMO wheat. It's just been hybridized. Like it's been going for thousands of years. And there's no way that our wheat today, even if we never messed with it, the wheat today would be vastly different than the wheat of thousands of years ago, just because hybridization, it just happens naturally. It's gonna go on, it's gonna continue. So just because we're not eating the exact same thing thousands of years ago, which by the way, we're pretty much not on many things because it's been hybridized. It happens naturally. That's how God designed it. And it's fine. Now, again, I am completely against genetically modified anything because, um, we don't even, I mean, I see it as playing God. God. If God wanted a tomato to breed with a bug, he would have made it happen. And I think that we're really messing with things for genetic modification. We do not need to be playing God because I guarantee you there are things there that we don't even know about yet that we are messing with and we don't know about the damage that can occur. Of course, a lot of things have already come out of what genetically modification does to humans, but that's a different video. So again, it's not the wheat that has been, that is bad in and of itself. It is the flour that has been messed with. White flour today, bread that you buy in the store, it has been stripped of all of its nutrients, all the vitamins have been oxidized, um, all that's left is just the starch um, and the gluten. And then a lot of times in bread, extra gluten is even added. So you wonder why people have issues with gluten. It's because you've stripped all the fiber, you've, you've stripped all the nutrition that God put into wheat berries that we're supposed to consume and have, and it's good for us. It's why Jesus compared himself as the bread of life, because bread sustained humanity for thousands of years. And it would be still sustaining us today if we didn't keep constantly throwing down our throats, fake food, fake flour, playing God with our food in a way that he never intended to happen. So again, what I say about wheat, I do always recommend buying organic wheat berries um, because I also don't want the extra pesticides and things like that. So to go even further, buy organic wheat berries. Again, I purchased mine from Azure Standard, link below. But with that, buy organic wheat berries, mill your own wheat, y'all, and you're gonna get the best amount of nutrition that you possibly can. And if you're still freaked out about modern wheat, no problem. There's still rye, spelt, iron corn, emmer, all of those ancient grains, and also so many other whole grains as well. I mean, we have millet and barley and amaranth and kamut. And I mean, well, that kamut is an ancient grain, but we have all these other grains that you can have. So a lot of the naysayers are gonna talk are gonna mention on this video that how wheat is still a poison. Okay, okay, well, go ahead and mill and consume einkorn. Oh, you're not gonna do that either? Okay, well then, you know, you know, your your argument kind of falls flat. Because a lot of times people who have issues with wheat, they are against all grains. They don't want anything to do with it at all. They think it's horrible. And so, there you go. Remember, first and foremost, that God gave us wheat. He created it. It's a seed. And he first gave us all the herb-bearing seeds in the garden. And wheat was there, y'all. It was there in some way, shape, or form because he gave it to us as food. And Jesus compares himself to it, the bread of life. So don't let anybody steal your bread, y'all. Don't let anybody mess with it, meaning mill your own. 
mill your own, y'all. And that's why this channel is here, to help you on your journey with consuming fresh whole grains the way that God intended it. So I hope this is really helpful for you. I, I know it's long, I know it's chatty, and I'm hoping that it broke broke everything down for you. As always, if you have any questions for me whatsoever, please comment below. I like to chat with y'all in the comments. And as always, I'll see you next week. Bye.